Okay, so good afternoon, guys. So welcome to uh, for today's session on the DevOps Foundation classes. So in the last session, that is on the day three session, uh, we had covered few of the servers, right? Like we had covered the message queues, cache servers, and you know even on the load balancer, right? These are these stuffs which we had covered in the last session, and uh, it's been quite long since we you know didn't record it, and today we'll be recording the day four session. Okay, and today's date is 27th. So today we'll keep our session a little quite small. We'll not really, you know, have a big session today. Uh, okay, because uh, the topic is very small today. And uh, uh, we would be uh, covering many more topics in the upcoming uh, sessions. So what are those things I will be discussing now? I mean, I'll be discussing at the end of this today's session. Okay, so what we are going to cover today. So we understood about something on servers and all. Okay, fine, that's fine. But we have not did any kind of a practical things. So in the upcoming sessions, we will be doing practicals. Means we will be installing some kind of an application server. We'll be installing or we'll be deploying some kind of a, uh, you know, like a web servers. Those are the stuffs which we will be covering. As well as we will get into some, uh, some things on the networking part also, where we'll be understanding about what is networking is all about, right? How exactly the two servers communicate each other, right? So those things and all will be covering the upcoming sessions and the probably in the next sessions. So in today's session, what will be covering? So we will be covering about the computing model. I mean, uh, it's this this today's session is completely on the theoretical part. Uh, no, we don't really have uh, any kind of a, a practical things. But yes, but it is very important because like we will be coming across a lot of terminologies, right? When we are working as a DevOps engineer, right? Most of this terminologies comes under this computing model. And if you see in the computing model, like uh, we have a, a very important architecture. We call it as a client server architecture. And so architecture, right? So you know that whenever, <coughs> whenever an application is hosted or whenever the application is deployed, it is deployed into some kind of a server, a very uh, high computing server, right? Which has a very good, uh, uh, you know, hardware requirement and everything. Where uh, in those servers we go and we deploy it, right? Right? Uh, like for example, like if I take it, uh, let me go here and. Uh, Suppose let me search for some server image. Okay, so let me take this. I always take this. Let me take some other server. Yeah, this look good. Right, so this is the server actually. So this is a server. Right, and we have various clients. So client can be anything, it could be a browser, right? So let me check for the browser. Uh, right, let it by, or else I can go with some kind of a user icon, right? Okay, this is a user or a browser, right? So I'll go with this. So basically I'm just drawing a typical client and server architecture. So this is my, user or this is the client, right? So it's not only one client, you might be having a multiple clients, right? You'll be having multiple clients and each and every client always, whenever they want to access any application, they will try to send a request to the server. Correct? Always server, will receive any kind of a connection from the client, right? Because why the, because server here, some kind of a service or some kind of an app service is running over here. Some kind of a application service or app service is running over here. Whenever a client needs an application to be accessed, the client sends a request to the server and server is going to serve the service to the client. So this we call it as a clients, right? So this is a, a typical, a very basic, simple client server architecture. So 
So we have been reading, we have been coming across this many times, right? So, uh, so here what happens, server is basically, it's a hype computing resource. It means that basically it needs, uh, this needs, uh, uh, this needs, the server needs the higher configuration resources. Right. For example, you need to have a, a high computing CPUs. You need to have a, a large number of RAM size memory. Right. You need to have a minimum good amount of hard drive. Right. These are some kind of a resources. So you could see that always in the server side, you will have a, a high computing uh, resources will all, should always be there. Why? Because right, an application when it is hosted or an application when it is running in the server, it requires such kind of resources. So without these resources, the, the application cannot run, right? So that's the reason what happened, right? In the server side, always you need to have a, a high computing resource, resource hardware we need it actually. It's not only one server, you could have multiple servers also. So here I'm just trying only one server. So in the real time, do you think that you'll be having only one server? No, you will be having a multiple servers like that. So you'll be having a multiple servers like this, which is in a, which is, will be in a clustered environment, which will be in a clustered environment. Correct guys? So it'll be in a clustered environment. So now, and in the client side, do you need any kind of resource, a high computing resource or no, not really required. It is a, just a very uh, simple uh, application which you are running through, which you are actually connected to the server. And that application could be a browser, right? A browser in one of the client. So do you think that for the browser, it needs a heavy computing resource? No, a very, uh, you know, a light, a thin, light uh, weight, uh, you know, like a browser is required where, you know, like you uh, launch the browser and you give a URL to hit it and when you hit the URL or when you hit the IP address or the URL, right? A connection will get established from the client to the server, right? And how exactly it gets established? We have a lot of protocols. We have something known as a TCP protocol or TCP IP protocol. This is one of the very important protocol through which a client and server can communicate each other, right? You have various other protocols also, like for example, you have UDP protocol also. TCP stands for uh, Transmission Control Protocol. UDP stands for User Datagram Protocol. So TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol. And UDP stands for User Datagram Protocol. IP is nothing but Internet address, internet IP. Internet IP or internet port is internet IP. IP or port, IP or port. So it uses the TCP IP protocol for communication. Most of the uh, application, right? Most of the service, uh, most of the uh, protocols, like for example, HTTP protocol or HTTP protocol, FTP protocol, right, or else you have a NFS protocol. All this protocol, they use as the TCP IP protocol. TCP IP for communicating between the client and server. Suppose you are having NFS server, you are having SSS server, right? Even SSS also, right? SSS also uses the TCP IP. We have communicate between the client and the server. So you have a, various different protocols and very important are TCP and uh, UDP. So TCP is called as a transmission control protocol and TCP is basically, it is a reliable protocol. It's a reliable protocol and it is a, a complete connection oriented protocol. I'm not really getting into much detail into this. I'm just telling you. UDP is a, uh, UDP is a, what? UDP is a, Okay, UDP is what? UDP is a user data protocol. It's a unreliable protocol. So TCP is a reliable protocol. 
right? This TCP protocol is a reliable protocol. Whereas the UDP, it is a unreliable protocol. Unreliable. Unreliable protocol means protocol. It means that it is not a connection. It is not a connection oriented protocol. We need not to get into much details. I'm just telling you in a very high level. UDP is a unreliable half duplex connection less oriented protocol. Connection less oriented. This is a very important term. Connection less oriented protocol. So TCP, why we call it a, uh, you know, why we call it as a reliable protocol? Because before the client starts sending a data, first the client has to establish a connection between the server. Means the client has to first set the connection between the server. Once the connection is established, it means that okay, now the connection has been established. Okay, so. Now, when the connection is established, it means that, okay, there is a channel through which a client can connect to the server or terminal server. So once the channel is established or once the complete connection is established with the help of a TCP API protocol, then what happens, right? Client can send the data and server will receive the data. Similarly, server can send the data to the client and the client can receive the data. So this we call it as a full duplex, complete connection oriented protocol, which is nothing but the TCP IP protocol. Okay, and the services or the or the applications or nothing but the uh, protocol which users which users are HTTPS, FTP, NFS, SSH. These are some of few of the uh, you know like uh, services which uses this TCP/IP protocol. Okay, so it means that it has to establish a complete connection before the it starts sending data, and that complete connection in TCP what we call it as a three-way handshaking. Some of you might have heard it. Three-way handshaking. So, guys, always what happened, right? Whenever a client is connecting with the server using a TCP protocol, it means that first it has to happen a three-way handshaking. Once the three-way handshaking happens, then only what happened? A complete connection has been has been established between the client and the server, and then the client can send the data to the server, and server will receive it. And again, if the server want to send the data to the client, it can send the data to the client. So it means that during the transmission of the data or the packet, there is no loss of data in TCP IP because the already a three-way handshaking has, has been established. If you go to the net and you just do a, a three-way handshaking, let's say so three-way handshaking in, in TCP. Can you see here, guys? We can go through this article. So there's an acknowledgement, the sync for the acknowledgement and the acknowledgements. So once this three transmission of the segmentation segment uh, happens between the two servers, then a complete connection has to be established. See, this is the client and the server. So it sends a synchronous segment. Okay. So that synchronous segment has a port number and the destination IP address and the port IP address. Once the synchronous segment has been sent to the server, server will receive the synchronous segment and server will send an acknowledgement to the client saying that, okay, I have received the segment what I've sent. Similarly, once that acknowledgement has been received from the server to the client, client has to send an acknowledgement saying, hey, whatever you have sent, I've received it. So for that, client will again send one more acknowledgement. So here, the transmission of the three synchronous segments has happened between the client and server. This is possible with the help of a TCP IP. So that's what we call it as a three-way handshaking. So this is very, very important article, guys. You can go through it, you'll understand it. So it is just at a high level, we are understanding what exactly in the client and server, when the TCP IP communication is used, the three-way handshaking should happen. Once this three-way handshaking happens, it means that now you have established a dedicated connection between the client and the server. Correct? And now client can send a data to the server and server can receive it. It means that in between or during the communication, no loss of the packet or no loss of the data happens because there is something known as an acknowledgement to it. Whenever the client or whenever the browser is sending a packet to the server, the server, the client has to receive an acknowledgement for that. So once it receives, the client understands, okay, whatever our packet I've sent it, oh, it has reached reach to the destination server. So whenever the server will send a, the data to the client, same thing, server will wait for an acknowledgement till it receives that acknowledgement. Once it receives that acknowledgement, the server will understand, okay, whatever the actual data or the payload data which I have sent to the client or to the browser, now oh, it has reached it. So this is all because of the 
dedicated dedicated uh, established which has happened which you call the three way handshake key the same three way handshake key guys it is not there in udp udp what happened right client browser will directly send the data to the server and server will receive it actually right and the server if it sends the data direct to the client it sends the data so if they are using client and server if they are using a udp protocol for the communication there is no guarantee that data is the data is going to reach to the destination server because there is no concept of acknowledgement in udp clear so udp is a unreliable protocol there is no three way handshake happens it is a half duplex unreliable connectionless oriented protocol we say so once there is no connection established between the UDP, uh, sorry client and the server in case of udp it means that we cannot guarantee the data uh, during the transmission will be lost or not we cannot guarantee it because there is no concept of acknowledgement in udp is it clear guys any doubt you have here or is it difficult for you to understand guys naresh no sir did you understood sir. yeah yeah yes sir. sagar did you understood yes sir yes sir okay so now here what happened in the udp but then in that case you will say sir why we are using udp then udp is a faster way of communicating whenever the client and server are using udp udp is very faster because it doesn't spend much time in the acknowledgement there is no concept of acknowledgement right in udp no concept of acknowledgement concept of acknowledgement so what happened right udp is a faster way of communicating it is a faster way of communicating correct then you will say sir like in that case if the during the transmission of data if we we are if the client and server if they are using the udp protocol for communication if the packet is lost if the data is lost then uh, what is the use then it is not like that see sometime what happened right uh, uh, there is a there is a time uh, so there is a requirement comes where you need to do a faster relay you know for example like uh, suppose um that india goes to the uk or it goes to the london or the uh, england to play a cricket during the live match relay right you have to send a lot of data right so that the viewers can watch the live uh, you know cricket at that time you cannot use tcp you use udp protocol you use udp protocol because user udp is a very fast stream streaming of data because there is no acknowledgement direct it sends the data if in between some data is lost uh, what happened uh, the people know who are sitting right the multimedia people they will arrange it they'll correlate it actually have you seen have you observed one thing uh, some many times that suppose some uh, in uh, in news channel suppose uh, in the republic tv arnab goswami is speaking right? he is giving every day uh, you know 9 o'clock night uh, 9 pm right there's a live uh, relay happen right in his channel and a lot of viewers indian viewers and many other viewers he, they watch this shows right so arnab Gos, uh, goswami is show they watch actually the news channel uh, they they watch it actually so they what they do now they use a udp protocol for the communicating because they are doing a live so people have to uh, see the live what is going on in between some packet is lost uh, no problem you will see the glitches in the video you could see that uh, uh, at one location arna will be you know standing st uh, you know standing or sitting straight in the other uh, just the next frame no he will be tilting head actually so you cannot make out the difference because even though there is a loss of some few packets what happened right the channel the multimedia people who are sitting in the back end right in the republic tv they will correct it they will man they will match it actually they will match the frame so that you will feel the continuity of the video even though some data are lost so in that case what happened guys udp is very much useful tcp might not be that much helpful when you are doing a direct streaming or relay because always tcp tcp needs an acknowledgement much of the time we will always go for the acknowledgement 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 in that case you cannot see the faster way of uh, throughput through the tcp clear and uh, one example uh, is nothing but i think you might have heard about sip protocol sip protocol session initiation protocol protocol this sip protocol is very important guys i am not telling you when you need to read it only networking fellows will read it session initiation protocol this is very important this protocol it uses in turn it uses your what udp protocol can you see here it uses a stream media fast streaming media 
when you are doing a relay, right? A direct relay, it uses the SIP protocol. SIP protocol is used, but SIP protocol in turn, it uses a UDP2 protocol, user data form protocol, right? So here, uh, if you see the diagram, how they have designed, the guys who have designed, right? They have designed something like this. They have designed the SIP protocol is working. This is a SIP protocol. This is for the diamond transmission. At the below end, right, how they have done, they have used the UDP protocol also. They're using the UDP protocol for doing a transmission like this. This is a UDP protocol. Or you UDP header, they use it actually for the transmission. You need not to know all these things. I'm just telling you in a very high level. Clear? So now, what happened, right? So UDP and TCP, but of course, in our major thing, whenever we are uh, working on any kind of a server or whenever we are communicating or whenever we are having a three-tier or a two-tier architecture, there obviously, most of the time, we will be using TCP proto IP only for the communication. Client and server communicate with the TCP IP because we need a reliable communication. We are not doing any direct relay or something. We are not using any for streaming, right? We need to establish a proper connection because it is not one client, guys. It are hundreds or thousands of clients will connect to the server because some important application will be running over here. I cannot use UDP protocol for communicating. I cannot say, okay, uh, client, you just connected, uh, but we don't guarantee that your data will reach to us. Similarly, when the server sends a data to the client, oh, we cannot guarantee that the, uh, the server, uh, we cannot guarantee the data is going to reach to the browser. We cannot uh, do like that in the actual real time, right? When the client is actually connecting to the, an actual application, right, which is running in the server, you cannot because there we have to use a TCP IP protocol only, right? So it is very important. But guys, there is only one, uh, uh, you know, like there is only one problem here. Since we are having a multiple cluster, that is fine. But sorry, multiple servers which are in a clustered environment or something, that is fine, very good. But assume that we are having only one server and there are multiple clients are getting connected. There is a possibility that the server might go into the failed state, right? The server might come down or due to some issues, what happened, the server might come down. It might not serve the service to the customer. So there will be a single point of failure might happen in the real time if you are working with only one server. So that's the reason, guys, what happened, right? you'll have something like a, Grid server, it like grid with some set of servers will be having, which will be in a clustered environment. So this is what the actual real time where you will not have only one server, you'll be in the back end, you'll be having a multiple server. It will be a replica of the same server. If this server, what are the higher configuration is there? No, the same server, all each and every server will be having the same hardware configuration. There will not be any difference at all. If this server is having one terabyte of hard disk, even this server will also have one terabyte hard disk. If this server is having a 32 uh, CPU core CPU, even this CPU, this server will also have a 32 core CPU. There will not be any kind of a differences in kind of a hardware resources when you are having in, uh, the servers in a cluster around because you need to keep a same. What happened? If you need to keep a same server configuration when you're working in a clustered environment. Clear guys? So this client and server is a very beautiful architecture which we are having. Hello sir. Yes madam. So in both case TCP IP and uh, UDP uh, model like uh, here browser main, uh, main any browser like uh, Google, Chrome, they acts as a client sir. Yeah, acts as a client. Yes, you can use either mm -hmm. TCP. It depends upon the application. If yeah. your application is uh, built uh, using a TCP IP protocol, then what happened? Your browser will connect to the TCP only. Okay, okay. If you are, if you are having, suppose for example, you, you might have seen in one of, in many of the uh, uh, companies, right? What happened? They will they will try to set up an FTP server actually. Okay. Right? What is that? okay let, let me give you an example of TCP. TCP is nothing but your HTTP, FTP, NFS, and SSH. These are TCP. So these are the these are the uh, you know services which uses the TCP protocol, right? Which is a TCP protocol. Sorry. Which uses the TCP protocol? I think I have to close it. Yeah. So which uses this TCP protocol? UDP protocol example. Uh, your SIP protocol. So for the UDP, there is a SIP uh, uh, protocol. It uses UDP intern. There is one more uh, you might have not heard. U boot actually, and there was one more. There was a TFTP, Trivial File Transfer Protocol. 
Your FTP will use a TCP protocol. It also uses UDP also. It, you can have a UDP protocol, FTP, you can configure where it uses a UDP protocol also. That's the reason I'm coming to that, that in, any, in many of the industries, what happened, right? They will try to serve the FTP server actually like this. They will try to serve an FTP server like this. This would be the FTP server. I'm not going into very much in detail, but the confidence such a way that it works in UDP protocol only. It uses UDP protocol. This is within your company, inside a company. It means that what you'll do, what you'll do, you will set up an FTP server, you place a lot of important files uh, or repositories in your FTP server. You might have kept a lot of files or repositories or many kind of a repository. Repository means something like a packages. You might have kept a lot of packages. Right? A lot of files or downloadable files. You might have kept sometime a lot of um, uh, you know, like uh, Installable uh, softwares, installable softwares, or not but installer softwares, right? Like for example, a lot of .exe, exes and all, right? Installation softwares and all you have kept in FTP server. So within your company, inside a company, you might have a lot of clients, right? A lot of people, we all are client, right? So what happened, right? We will connect to this FTP server. So this FTP server, it might be having an IP address like 192.168.0.10, something. Okay, under that, okay, inet pub, pub slash inet pub, right? And you might have kept some folder name, something like uh, uh, program, something, or a directory, something. Some folder stuck name like will be there like this. You know, and you'll be told in your company that whenever you want to access FTP server, open the browser. Like you'll open the Chrome like this. You'll open the Chrome like this. You will just be told like this. Use FTP like this you do. 192.168.10.0. Whatever the IP address. 0 0.10. Yeah. Like this you give it like this. I mean, it will not work here. I'm just telling you. You know, in many of the companies, they will tell you like this. You have to hit it. Once you hit like this, right, it will show you all the different folders, subfolders, where you have kept for the package installation, where you have kept for the download of files. Everything it will open in a browser, actually. See, here you're using FTP. You are using FTP protocol for opening your FTP server. It means that. So what happened right here, you are not really interested much in the acknowledgement part. Why you need a dedicated... Why you need a dedication, a dedicated connection established? Because TCP uses the dedicated uh, established connection, right? Once a dedication, how do you, how do you, how do you, how it does it internally? It does with the help of a three-way handshaking. Once a three-way handshaking happens using TCP, a dedication, a dedicated established has been established, has been done between a client and server, and the client can serve the uh, and the client can connect to the server or it can send the data. But whereas in UDP, it doesn't really require. You can just directly send the data to the FTP server or to the server and the server will respond to you. If in case, if here in this case, if any if any packet is dropped, if any data is dropped, no problem. Again, you can reestablish the connection. Here what happened, you're not really worried or you're not really looking for an acknowledgement. You know, you, you're not really looking for that kind of a, a complete connection establishment. No, I'm just sending a data. It will say, if the data is received to the client uh, server side, okay, that is fine. So in that case, what happened that right? you will be using a UDP protocol. So UDP protocol, guys, what it is happened that it the examples are SIP, U-boot, and TFTP. Trivial file. This is what I was explaining now. TFTP, trivial file transfer protocol. It uses in turn the UDP. So what is it? TFTP. So trivial file transfer protocol. This is what it is. So go through it. You will understand that TFTP relies on UDP to transport the data. Clear, guys? Clear? So these are the companies that do it, actually. Okay, fine. Fine. So now, <coughs> fine. This is what I was saying, that if there is only one server, if that server paint, uh, sorry, the server fails, Due to some uh, due to some uh, resources or due to some crunch of resources or due to big, uh, based on the operating system or due to a lot of load in application, the server might go down. So what happened? Right, all these uh, 
uh, clients which are connected to the servers, it might uh, it might not get the service because there is a single server. That's the reason what happened in the industry. We don't have a single servers, guys. We'll have a multiple servers, which we call it as a distributed system. So what is the next architecture? What we have is a distributed system. You might have heard about this, right? Distributed systems. Very famous, actually, distributed systems. Like, for example, the technologies like Hadoop, the technologies like blockchain, they use this, they, they use this technology. They use uh, this distributed uh, system technology to max, to maximum they use it actually. To maximum they use it, right? Up to the max they use it actually. Yeah. Now, what is this distributed system? If I go to the diagram, if I let me check or let me search if there is any uh, uh, distributed uh, uh, system icon. Huh? No, not give icon. Yeah, this is what I was talking about. Uh, yeah, this is something like this, you can say. So this is in a distributed system. This is what the distribution system, right? So if, let me draw a diagram then. Okay. So uh, let me take the server icon. Okay, let me take some other server icon like this. Yes. I was looking for one more better icon. Uh, okay, let me take this itself. Yeah. So this is server we have. So here what happened guys, it's not only server actually, it's not only one server, you'll be having a multiple servers like this. Like this. And usually in distributed system, we call you don't call it as a server, guys. We call it as a nodes, actually. What we call? We call it as a node, not so we don't call it as a real as a server. We call this all as a nodes only. And basically, what happened, right? Uh, there is some kind of a application service which will be running in this nodes. Each and every node, the same application service will be running here. App service will be running. So some kind of a app service will be running here in each and the same app service. I think I have to copy this. <coughs> Sorry. Same thing. Right? So the same service or the application will be running in each and every node, which is in, in this is nothing but your distributed systems. So now, so basically what happened, right? You will be having some kind of a client actually. So the client can be anything like browser icon or else user icon. So he's a client actually. He's a client or he's a user actually. Client or the user. Right. And all these servers, guys, they will be uh, they will be connected over the network actually. Uh, they will be in the same subnet or there could be in a different subnet. That doesn't really mean. But they are into some kind of a they have connected to some kind of a network through which they actually they can connect, they can communicate each other like this. You might say, sir, if they are in same subnet or different subnet, same zones, different zones, same place or different, it could be anything. 
there could be distributed in the whole globe we don't know there could be in different different places but they all are connected with some kind of network where they can communicate each other so this is what in a distributed system now what happened in the client the client what happened right whenever the client want to connect to the server whenever the client want to connect with the server it can connect to any of this server actually it doesn't mean that it has to connect to that particular server only it can connect to this server it can connect to any any one server the client can connect actually but basically what happened right uh, with, with this distributed system uh, there is something uh, we call it as some kind of a consensus we say con c u n s u s right consensus or we call it the election happening okay so in the distributed system there is something uh, there is a, an algorithm basically which runs which uh, uh, forms a consensus between this all these six nodes okay some kind of election happens where they will try to make one as a winner or one as a master node assume that this server will become a master node this server this server a this is a server a assume that this server a will become a master node after the election right so in the distribution there sometimes a consensus if you try to even uh, uh, go to the google and just say uh, consensus in distributed system so the process of consensus see so in the consensus what happened there will be some kind of a election happens actually between all the nodes where they will try to elect who will be the who will be the server who will be serve the service to the end client it's not like all the servers will be uh, serving the client only one server will be uh, you know serving the client here in this case if the server a if it is serving this client all rest of the other server will be kept quiet they won't do anything they'll be still simply running but they will not be serving any kind of end client service because already a master node is there uh the server a is there how this got created this is because of the consensus or election the same concept guys it is there in our uh, you know in our kubernetes also in kubernetes we call it as a raft actually the kubernetes we call it the raft a raft in kubernetes so uh, using the raft uh, if you are having a kubernetes cluster there also some kind of an election can happen where <coughs> it will decide which is your kubernetes master if you go through the google and just say uh, a raft in kubernetes something so see running ra uh, kafka k raft mode raft in kubernetes so what happened right uh, what is it i given not kafka rft raft this is what it is raft so there is something is a raft actually so you can go through some of the articles in the google okay okay or else uh, let me check it out so for some better example this one uh clustering and api using raft yeah this is what it is yeah the raft concert algorithm in distributed so go through this one guys this is the raft algorithm which is even used in our kubernetes also okay so i will not go into much detail about all these things so some kind of an election happens actually right during which the election consensus happens <coughs> it will try to select any one server as a master node or this server which serve the service right so now what happened this server sorry this client it sends a data so what it sends the data it said that <coughs> sorry so it said that the client will send a data and what would be the data will be sending something mm. forward to one node to serve it to serve the request It's an, because the client doesn't know who is the main server or into the distributed system, which is server which serve the service. How the client will know? It just sends a data to any one node to this distributed system. 
right? And through the distribution system, it understands, okay, this is the client, uh, sorry, this is the main server, server A, which will serve the service. So that particular request will be sent to that server. Like this, it happens in distributed systems. Clear, guys? So this is very important distributed system, as I said, right, in all the latest technologies in blockchain group, this is uh, heavily used. And in many organizations, we use this distribution system heavily. Okay. Okay. And uh, with this uh, distributed system, guys, we have something as a peer-to-peer, peer-to-peer uh, -peer system. Some of you might have heard about this peer-to-peer -peer system, but not really that much used, actually. I don't really uh, take up this, but uh, you know, like uh, if you, uh, I think earlier, right, uh, you used to have some, uh, most of you, might, I'm sure that you would have downloaded something on the torrent and all, right? So in the in the peer-to-peer -peer system also what happened, you'll be having a group of servers where, assume that in any one server, suppose in your in your friend's server, you'll be having some kind of a movie which has been, which he has kept. So what you'll do, you'll try to download uh, that movie from your friend's server. Once you download, you'll keep the same copy of the movie in your server. And even your server will, uh, will also act like a server where other person can actually download that same movie from you. So it means that actually in the peer-to-peer -peer system, what happened, you'll be having the same set of the copy of data from one server to other server. First, what happened within the peer system, you'll try to copy each other data. It is not but through the torrent, actually. And from there, what happened, right, in the future, if any of the other client outside who want to download he can download with any of the torrent or peer to peer systems so this is what we always uh, you know we have come across with this peer to peer system but i am not really that much worried about this right so there is nothing like much to discuss in that but peer to peer system also it is a kind of a distributed system only where you'll be having a group of servers right now, some people might ask a question, sir, like uh, how the data replica happens are here. Like, suppose like some, uh, you know, some data, uh, some changes happen over here, right? Some changes happen over here. How the same will happen, the changes happen in this multiple servers also. Even though other servers are not doing any kind of service, if some server, some changes happens to the application, the same replica should happen in the other servers also, right? In distributed systems, right? Some people might have some kind of a doubt actually. Right. So what happened right? in the distribution, they use something as a replicas or we call it the strats actually. So in distribution, we use something known as the replicas. And there's a concept of something as strats actually. So this is basically used. Okay. Even if you go to the Google and uh, you just give uh, what you can type. Uh, distributed systems users, uh, what is it? Uh, replicas, right? And strats. Okay, so this is the article, guys. You can go through it, some of the article, replicas and strats, actually. So this is what it uses internally for doing a replication of the data, right? From one server to the other server. How the replica happens, everything we can go through this article. Clear? Okay. There is one more article was there which I was going through. Uh, this is what medium.com. Yeah, this is a very good article. <coughs> I was going through this article. So this was very good. This is very good article actually. Trading methods, this one. So I'll give the link. We also put only. All these are just for like, uh, for the knowledge sake I'm saying. Okay, now uh, we, we were, even we have heard a, uh, concept or we have even a word many times known as a clusters, right? Clustering or you call it clusters actually. Now what are these clusters actually? So cluster is basically, it is a group of connected systems and they are 
group of connected systems and they are uh, viewed as a single large system for the end user right so here it, uh, you might have heard about uh, see you might have heard about sir there is a uh, application server cluster is there application server cluster is there okay uh, you might have even say that the database cluster is there means you have a set of data servers which you call as a database and they are in a clustered environment we say right similarly we have a uh, in the application server, we have something like a web logic server, actually. Web logic clustering server, actually. Here also, it's not one or two. There are multiple servers are there. But for the end user, it, it looks like a single server. But at the back end, it is nothing but it's a, it is, it's a num n number of servers which are present, actually. It looks like something like a distributed system only. It is a distributed system, actually. It is a distributed system. So this is what we, uh, this we call as a clustered environment, the group of the servers, we say. Right, like for example, if I okay, let me so we have a I'll take one more icon here. So, here also, what happened, right? You have a n number of servers actually, like this. Like this, n number of servers will be there. Same thing. They are also connected through the same. Uh, they are connected to the same network, or they could have connected to the through a different network, or through completely different, uh, like uh, different network. They could have connected with each other. Right. Like this. Sorry, I'm not that good in diagram, but like this, they are connected to each other. And for the outside world, guys, this whole server, right? This server, right? Okay, this, uh, it looked like a very big server, actually. Uh, it looks like a big server like this. So it means that for the end user, so this whole cluster, right? For the end user, it, like, it looks like a single server only. But in the back end, they'll be having a multiple server. So here what happened, right? The user, he'll always be communicating with only one server. He he feels like he's connect, communicating with only one server, actually. Right? So this is nothing but the user, actually. So user will always be communicating with only one server only. Right? So this is nothing but for the out, out person, the, for the outside, it looks like a single server only. This is the outside perspective. Right? But in the back end, you could see that you will have an n number of servers which is in a clustered environment. Right? So this is nothing but we call this as a cluster actually. And you know that we have a various different types of clusters. We have an application server clusters, you have a database servers. Uh, database uh, cluster servers because these are all they are the they are all group of server connected each other right correct okay guys so that's all about this uh, cloud computing okay uh, I will tell some more details later okay so what we are going to understand now is that as a DevOps engineer it is very important that you need to understand about the servers what type of servers we have and what are the different architecture. In our upcoming sessions, what we'll be learning, we'll be learning about, right? We'll be learning about the servers. Like we'll take an example of uh, one applicant server, right? What is an uh, So we'll take an example of Tomcat server. What I will do the next session, uh, I think before that, before this server, I will be discussing about the two tier architecture and three-tier architecture. This is what I'll be discussing next session. 
three tier architecture okay why we have we have gone into this architectures right and later what happened right when it comes to the server we'll be learning about few of the servers like for example application server so in the application server we have some there's a tomcat server so what we'll do here we will try to understand how what how exactly a tomcat server works how to install it install the tomcat server how to host the a simple uh, java based application in this tomcat server this is what we will be learning this is stepping stone us for us to learn and after that we will also learn about how to install a web server how to install a web server please configure and install the web server we'll take an app, example of apache how to install apache and uh, install understand the configuration understand the configuration right and uh, do the modification into the configuration files and make it work and uh, how internally the apache server works and then we'll be discussing about what is a proxy server A reverse proxy and differences with the web server. What is what is the, the proxy server reverse proxies and the if the is there any difference between the proxy server reverse servers or with the with the, your web servers? Some people have this kind of a doubt. Is there any difference or is it same, right? And what is the difference between the web server and the load balancer? You might have some kind of a confusions over there that I thought that I will clarify those things in the upcoming sessions. So this is what guys I'll be covering it in the next one or two sessions. I'll be covering it. Okay. But the most important, <coughs> this is about the next session guys, but very important what a DevOps in has to know, or he has to understand that how exactly the developer writes a code. It means that he need not to really understand that. Actually, I'm just saying that, Okay, from the uh, from the DevOps perspective, like what the developer will do, developer will write the code. He will write the code. He'll write the fine, that's fine. But as a DevOps engineer, what we have to do with the code? So basically, guys, you need to basically build the code and build the code, package it and deploy it. Deploy to the server. This is what the DevOps unit will be doing most of the time, right? So whatever the language through which a developer has written, he might have written the application in the Python language. He might have written an application to the JavaScript. He might have written a uh, application using Java or using some kind of a .NET framework or using some Node.js. He could have or C++ any language he might have used it. That is immaterial for a DevOps engineer. He has to only understand that, okay, he has written, the developer has written the, the code actually. How I need to build that code? Build means compile the code or and how I need to package so that it becomes a deployable, uh, uh, so that I can deploy that application or that package mm -hmm. to the server. So that would be the main concern for a DevOps engineer, right? So here, what happened, right? Code build or packaging this. Right. So, what are things you need to understand, guys? How to build the code or convert the code to the package into the package. This is what we need to understand it. Then what else? So we know that the developers will write the code. But when the application is deployed, we don't use really installed actually, uh, because when we when we uh, try to do some kind of a um, 
uh, uh, you know, you want to install an application or you want to host the application, right? We use this terminology deploy actually. We don't you really use the install. I mean, we can use it install, but install doesn't really good. Installing something like installing the software, right? So this is the term we use because suppose you say that, sir, I want to install the, you want to, I want, I want to have a, you know, like a Google Chrome in my server or in my laptop. I'll say, go and download uh, the Chrome installer, man, Chrome installer, right? Or go and download the Chrome uh, EXE and install it, I say. I don't say it as a, go and download the Chrome and install, uh, deploy it. No, I don't say, I use, don't use the word deploy when it comes to installing the softwares. But when you're, whenever you're configuring the, uh, the servers, like you said that I want to configure the Apache server, or I want to configure the Tomcat server, or I want to configure the Node.js server, we use this term as a deploy there. Right. Deploy means you need to deploy the middleware software and you need to configure the server. So together we call it as a deploy actually. Right. So developer will write the code. But when the application is deployed on the environment, onto the environment, on the environment. They might not use the code directly. Right? So it means that what? Do you think that whenever developers write a code, guys, whenever a developer, so assume that he's a developer, he will write a code actually. So developer will write a code. He will write the code using any language. He will write the code. Right? He'll write the code. And this code, assume that you, uh, the developer has written a Google Chrome code actually. Google Chrome browser is there, right? He's written the code for it. And you know that Google Chrome is written in the C++ language. Do you think that the whole code, whatever the developer has written, he will give that to the customer? Here a customer will be sitting. Do you think that the customer, uh, do you think the developer will directly give this code to the customer saying that, hey, you take this code, man, C++ code from me, and you make your application run, or you make this bro Google Chrome run? No, because the customer might not know about the language at all. He might not know. He might not know how C++ works. So that doesn't really work out like this. He will say, the customer will say that, hey, you create a package for me, and that package you give me as a as an installable or as a deployable, I will go and I'll install in my in my environment so that I can access your application. So the the developers never share the code to the customer or to the client because the client under, doesn't understand. It is not in an executable form. If you see the whole C plus plus code, do you think that is an executable form? No, you cannot execute it actually because it is not in executable form. It's just a plain raw code. You need to first build it actually. You need to build the code or you need to compile the code and create a package out of it or a deployable package out of it and then give this package to the customer or deploy this package to the customer environment and tell that, okay, I have deployed it actually so that the customer can access that application. So here, what happened that you need to understand the process, okay? How exactly developer write the code? We need to really understand how he writes and all. We need not even know the language also in which language is writing. Yes, but you need to understand how to build the package. So to do build the package, you need to understand, okay, there is some kind of a build tool is there, which I need to understand. Okay, to build tool, whether it works in a GUI, whether it's in a command line, yeah, the, most of the build tools are in the command line. So you need to understand like, what are the commands which are involved for doing the build activity? Like for example, if the developer has written a Java code, you know that, okay, sir, Java code, the best tool for to uh, build and package is the word Maven tool. So you need to understand how to install the Maven, how to use the Maven related commands to build it and how to build a package, right? And how to provide the package. So those things and all you need to, as a DevOps engineer, you have to understand. So what I was trying to tell here is that, <clears throat> that, so when a developer write the code, but when the develop, when, but when the application is, de is deployed, on the they might not use the code directly. Okay, right. So to deploy the code or to deploy the application, we generally use packages. 
we use some things as packet. Okay, we need to understand how to build the packet of source. Okay, this is also one of the important things, right? Right. <coughs> For example, if I was giving an example, right? For example, Google Chrome installer is used to install the Google Chrome. Not directly through the code, not directly through code return, but through a package. Right? You need to download the software or the package, right? And then we install it, right? So now the very important is that how to deploy the applications on the server. This is what once you build it. Guys, once you build everything, you need to finally deploy it, right? So you need to understand, yeah, how I have to deploy. This is the important task now, which the DevOps team has to understand. Right? So what will be our discussion now? From now, our discussion will be on how to get the code uh, converted into packages, okay, and deploy it. Deploy it means, it means that it should be an easily uh, deployable format. Do you agree with me? Right, so what I understand, okay, so I feel, I think that guys, uh, if I take, if I start discussing, it will take too much of time. So what we'll do, we'll stop it here, right? So I will see uh, if I'm able to take today's session evening or not. If not, uh, then tomorrow morning at around 9.15, I will take a session for you all. Okay, tomorrow, Monday, I will take, I'll continue from here itself actually. Okay, so we'll be discussing about what are the different kind of an applications you have, right? Uh, there is something or the uh, thick desktop application, thin applications we have. We have uh, something, uh, uh, you know, like nowadays we can even install everything in your mobile also, right? in your Android or iOS mobile, right? And so we have different types of applications we have, right? Those things we'll be discussing and then we'll be understanding about how exactly, uh, you know, the code will be, you know, compiled into the, uh, compiled and built as a package and all. We'll be taking an example, like for example, we'll take a, a example of uh, .NET or Java, and we will see what is the process of how to build and deploy it like that. And then we will take a real time uh, example of how to install an app Tomcat server and how the Tomcat internal works and finally how to host our simple application that also we'll be learning. So this, this is what I am just building a relation between what will be what we will be doing with the code and build uh, code build and package and finally taking an example of these two and making it work or else you can even uh, google it out or you can even uh, do an exercise of how to uh, deploy the java application some kind of a java application into the boss server just google it out see guys this would be an exercise for you all so you have to only understand the process and you have to, have to only understand the command. You need to first understand how, what Java server does, how to configure Java, that you have to do. And then how to take a code and what is the directory structure where I have to go and deploy it. That is what you have to understand. Mm -hmm. That would be the exercise for you. Or else you can even just say how to deploy a .NET application into the IIS server. This is also you can say take any one dummy uh, or .NET application, application and go and configure the IA server. Go and just see how you deploy it over that. Correct? So guys, I hope that in today's session you understood whatever we discussed. So in the next class, uh, today, probably not today, tomorrow morning, we will continue from here onwards. From the build and package only, we will continue. Clear? Okay, so let me stop the recording if there is no questions. Okay, thank you, sir. Hmm? Okay.